sometimes it grabs a hold of you so much that you don't want to let go. It grabs you right down there where it counts. You just can't get away from it. It grabs you right there with it. of life grabs a holly and sweeps through those poor little tired veins of yours like a great rushing torrent at the headwaters of the Mississippi itself, crashing its Watsatawney, crouching against the rocks and roaring onward and onward till finally the sea is reached. <laughs> Oh, it's just fantastic, this tremendous surge of light that is roaring through all of our American blades, all of our American veins together. Today I'm hanging out to that strap on the subway, and there's that sign facing me, and it says in great, almost elegiacal letters, gigantic gothic letters, it says, Going to a play is a lifetime memory. I'll never forget Geraldine Page. It's strange and alone. Never, never, never will I forget Mary Martin. And whoops, my dear. And I will never forget Jim Hunter. And oh my God, it's happening again. Fantastic memories that I will carry to my grave in Tennessee, Wyoming. And all the great mini miles. Yes, I wonder how many lifetime members. Uh, I really do. I, I have a strong feeling, Tony, that that uh, that most of our memories center around Tarzan, Johnny Weissmuller, and maybe Skeezix. <laughs> Great American characters in history. Uh, by the way, I will award you the brass figligi with bronze oak leaf palm. If uh, if you can tell me, well, it doesn't make any sense. Well, it won't matter. What? 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 Well, wait, wait till the uh, ideological argument is concluded there in the in the engineers' department. We will continue. Oh, speaking of ideological arguments, you already now. Are you all ready to hear what the 20th century is like, folks? I will right, hold it up there now. They're changing the guard in there. They got a very strong union. There's a little panoply that goes on, a little pomp. They change hats, and there's a little thing with swords and stuff they do, tooting of horns and stuff, and <laughs> kind of nice, you know. Yeah, while they're doing that, I'll drink some cold coffee out of a very cold cardboard cup. Oh, boy, when I drink cold coffee out of a cold cardboard cup from a bad cafeteria, the anger begins to surge up in me. It, it, believe me, it's a, it's, a, it's a strong stimulus, and I suspect that many a guy, funny, uh, I believe what 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 do you think is the most common taste today? Now I'm not talking about those rotten grills on the new kind. I'm discussing something else. Uh, uh, do you know that that almost every major picture in Hollywood today has a naked girl running through it somewhere along the line? Even the Doris Day picture I saw the other day. Even if she runs through very fast and is the co-star, she's there. So uh, it's like the old Hitchcock pictures. You know, everyone would look for the Hitchcock. You know, they'd all look for old Al there, old Fatso, and they'd say, oh, there he is, he's disguised as a potted palm. There he is, you can see the cigar sticking out of the leaves there. Well, well, uh, now the thing to do is to go to the pictures and see the naked girl. Uh, that's true. Are you aware of that? Very good, very good. I understand, I understand, of course, there's a lot of other things in store for us, for us uh, avid moviegoers, and... Uh, Many of the things, of course, are, are uh, they go much further than those things that they used to raid joints for at the Legion Hall on Saturday nights. You remember when they used to load all the guys into the paddy wagon over in Paramus at, the, at 11.30 at night? It says they were holding a, a benefit bingo for the poor of Peruvia. 
And uh, actually, of course, they had this film. But but that's <laughs> you know you of course you know that there's a whole group of stars of those films. Well, I'll stop it in a minute. I'll just be calm. Now all set for a a uh, a small religious ceremony of our time. And I, I I'm putting this into my vast file of trivia. Uh, although this is a double page spread, it's pretty hard to put this in the trivia. This is uh, from. Uh, from the Philadelphia Inquirer, which uh, has supplanted Captain Billy's whizbang in my mind as one of the funny, it's a, one of the true comic papers of our time. Now, are you all ready now for one of the more significant notes of our time? No, 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 already, oh, Eddie, no, now, see, see, changing the guard, you change everything but the instructions, there it goes. Here comes tomorrow. from a double-page advertisement that appeared in the January 8th issue of the Philadelphia Inquirer. We believe that all of you should hear it. Here comes tomorrow. Here they come, the greatest generation in history, also the best educated, the healthiest, the wealthiest. At Scott Tissues, we think the arrival of this generation will mark the beginning of a wonderful new era of change, growth, and progress. These girls running into the scene of today represent many things. They are the future, and someday, not too far off, they will carry the future into still another generation. are the why and the how of Scott Tissues. They are why we make forests grow and why we work nights in laboratories, why we cut trees and ship pulp and invent machines and train men and women to understand and to serve people. To us, the American woman is the goddess of the marketplace. The girl we study to please. At Scott, we have been studying the distaff side of this great tidal wave generation with all the modern means we now command. By surveys and research and computers, we know a great deal about them, their habits, preferences, and attitudes. Let us report directly one fact that shines through all these figures. These wonderful goddess girls are almost like their mothers were. They do have greater shopping skills at an earlier age, which is understandable, since as teenagers they have been spending $15 billion a year. The hardest thing to grasp about the goddesses of tomorrow is the almost astronomical size of their numbers. Each year, two billion goddesses get married at about the age of 20. One year, three million join the labor force. One third of the labor force is now composed of goddesses. At Scott, we do more than dream about the future of these girls. We help shape that future in small, pleasant ways. Design it, test it, manufacture it. We think ourselves into 1975 and try to convert 1984 into a beautiful time. Right now, as you read this, we are at work in all our plants and offices and laboratories for the generation of girls that will follow those of today. We work in our laboratories at strange new products, things even more fantastically light and useful than anything now made, things as light and fresh as spun sugar, Beautiful in design to be thrown away, and some may even be familiar things like shirts and slips and draperies and pots and pans, all functional, all attractive, and great blessing, all disposable so the goddess will not have to work. Even as we work in our laboratories, we are planting trees to be harvested 25 years hence to provide raw materials for products yet to be invented to serve a generation of goddesses yet to be born. Long ago, over a half century, Scott started with bathroom tissue, refining it endlessly into the soft and fluffy, beautiful strength of the products you know today, 
and went on into the design of many, many other products, creating a new major market. Thirty years ago, we introduced household paper towels, and we are moving steadily toward the day when all home cleaning will become so much easier, so much trouble-free, so much swifter, that the difference will seem fantastic to today's hard-working, grubbing woman. Tomorrow's goddesses will never lift a finger. Next, we pioneered fine paper napkins for universal use and then moved on into disposable cups and placemats. And now we have decided not to stop until the table-setting habits of the nation are completely revolutionized into a new kind of easier, modern, trouble-free, work-free living. But laboratory secrets are not all the answer. We want to do more. We must do more if we are to fulfill our commitment to serve future generations of goddesses. This is why, both directly and through financial support of the Scott Paper Company Foundation, we are deeply involved in educational projects and student grants in colleges all across the nation, and in aiding research in many places in the world. While we pursue these broader purposes, we must also attend to the manpower needs of our company today and tomorrow. We participate in student exchange programs. We have for many years engaged in a carefully structured program of summer work for students, helping foster their careers on and on. We have faith in the kind of revolution in today's young goddesses. They will bring it about. Even more, we have faith in them as people. Many specters haunt the modern mind. Our vision into the future is blocked by clouds, by doubts, by uncertainties and unknowns. But the vision clears when one looks at the fresh, vibrant girls, the goddesses who will help to manage things tomorrow. Tomorrow's homes and communities will be guided by their wonderful active hands and steady minds. And they are good hands, and they are good minds. We know what little girls are made of, and what big ones, too. And so, and so we say, let them come, let them come, the thousand, thousand girls, tomorrow's goddesses, the mothers of generation of goddesses beyond. Each running girl is moving hopefully toward adulthood with all of its promise of fulfillment. Each of our goddesses stands ready for wedding cakes and laughter, gifts and flowers and music and better living. And we will try to be ready for them. We at Scott Bathroom Tissues. That concludes our religious program for this evening. We now return to our regular programming over this, your concern station, WOR, AM, and FM in New York. It's kind of a long... <laughs> All right, will you shut up out there? Come on! All right, really! Professional jealousy is rampant in this joint. What a rat's nest. Speaking of rat's nests, we have with us tonight the pottery of all nations. And uh, believe me, this is a rat's nest if I've ever seen one. And if you have never visited the pottery of all nations, you will... It's a true rat's nest. And uh, yes, it is really true. They have little signs that say, break this, please. They have a sign, please handle the goods. And they have, they have another sign, don't steal over 17% of this shelf at any one given time. Uh, but if you do not know about the Pottery of All Nations, there's one down in Sheridan Square, and uh, there's one over on 64th and Lex, and there's one on Route 4 in Paramus, the drive-in movie street there. And the uh, Pottery of All Nations is magnificent in a sort of strange, disheveled way. And if uh, they busted all your glasses over the holiday and they stole all your ashtrays, and uh, you just like to scrounge around, this is a great scrounging place. And if you're coming into... New York over the weekend, please make the Pottery of All Nations scene. There's a tremendous discount house for magnificent imported pottery from all over the world's bill. Okay? There we go. There we go. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I would just like to do one, one thing tonight. I, I, I don't ordinarily do this. This is a, this is a depressing thing in a way. I, not really. I, I don't. Are there any goddesses with us tonight? 
No, seriously, you know it if you are, uh, and, uh, and and there is no question about it that the girl worship in America is riding, rising to a crescendo of almost of almost hysteria. I, I can't I can't even envision how it will be in the year 2000. Not that I'll be around to see it, but. But believe me, men will have atrophied by that time, Ed. They will have assumed the status in society of white mice. They will be friendly little pets with pink eyes and fluffy coats. In fact, you see a lot of them around on the east side now, down on Greenwich. Friendly little people with pink coats and white eyes. Well, I don't no, see it's a, But, you know, it's a, it, it is true. You know, when you're, living, when you're living among a generation of goddesses, it's pretty hard to be anything. I mean, what are you going to be, you know? Do you notice in that whole ad they never once mentioned men? Well, that's right. We're growing a generation of goddesses in the old Scott. What is it Scott makes? Huh? It's funny how they. <laughs> have you noticed that women always appear in those ads? I said, Why is that? Little girls. Stay. I don't know. It's very interesting. Uh, some night when we get into our advanced course in abnormal psychology, that's after the after the March fifteenth deadline. For those of you who passed this semester's course, we'll get into that particular aspect of modern advertising technique, which is the ecclesiastical associated with the very mundane. The first ecclesiastical commercial I ever heard had to do for some stuff you poured down into your sink when it got stopped up. Well, that isn't the only place you poured it uh, when it got stopped up. And, and there was an absolute gothic church-like calm about the commercial, you know. <laughs> So uh, I, I, I believe that that that, that uh, wherever I've gone in in this uh, somewhat bespeckled life, I've I've learned that 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 uh, that the closer you get to to reality in whatever the product is that you sell, the more you attempt to soar into the heavens. Uh, I'll never forget the time that I actually had a commercial for a guy that had galvanized zinc garbage pails, and uh, no, this is the truth. And this guy would come in, tears would come down, would, would just have to stream down his eyes, uh, because I, I did it in my Westbrook Van Vorty's voice. And uh, he loved it so much that, that he had records made and sent them out to all of his friends at Christmas time. And we had organ music behind it, in case you're interested. Uh, it was Schubert that played the organ behind these garbage can commercials. And, uh, and uh, yes, and, and we would end with the sound of the lid coming down. It was very nice. They'd cue it in a little chunk, clank. And you could hear the you could hear the eggshells rattling around and the and the you know all the stuff falling out and he, and and it was just a beautiful thing and he loved it and and uh, <laughs> I don't know whether you have have seen the commercials I'm talking about on television there there are a couple that that are just uh, it just just really embarrasses the daylights out of me I mean there's a girl that shows up who looks like she is molded out of pure alabaster and. And she is lit by what appears to be a, a, a cross between Philippe Halsman and with perhaps a little touch of Cartier-Bresson. Magnificent lighting. And behind her comes music that sounds roughly like... It sounds... Well, I don't have to tell you what she's selling. She's got a long, filmy gown. And I just hate to tell you what she said. We won't even go into that. It's very embarrassing. Then, then there's another one. Have, have you seen the one where, where you're looking out, uh, speaking of getting, <laughs> of, of associating the totally earthy with the ethereal? Have you noticed the one where you're looking out through the wings of a theater and you see spinning magnificently a wounded swan, yes, a dying swan, that lovely, lovely swan-like ballerina. Look at that little elfin creature, that creature of the glade in the forest. The tiny dying signet spin and spin and spin and spin. A flower of womanhood, a flower of beauty and art. And now she rises higher and higher and higher. Like a dove, she floats over the stage back and forth. And then suddenly she stops. She is through. The crowd roars, a great roar of applause. And now she comes darting backstage as we hear the orchestra quietly fluttering behind her. The lovely ballerina, her tiny arched neck held at a lovely, lovely artistic angle. And suddenly our camera darts down her elbow, down up her arm, and we are now looking at her arm. It stops. 
She's smelly. Oh. Oh, but no, this girl takes proper precautions before she does. What like? <laughs> now, don't come and say Shepherd is in bad taste. Have you seen the commercial? I'm sure some friendly little like, Dear Mr. Shepherd, I think that was in awful taste. And, of course, she's sitting there with her old mouth hanging open and her dentures flapping, watching that same commercial night after night after night after night. And she says, Isn't that a lovely little girl? Look at that lovely girl, Dads. Madam, have you taken proper precautions with the rub-on deodorant? Yes, this little girl who must protect herself. <laughs> yes, indeedy. Clunk. Oh, I can I can go on and on and on. There's several several other. Uh... Oh yeah, yeah. There's no question about that. That 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 the that the closer to the earth you are, the more you crawl on the deeper organ tones. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's, there's another one. Uh, of course, uh, some of them are so embarrassing, you know, that on radio you can't even talk about them. Have you noticed that? No, it, it is really, literally true. You, there are some things you watch on television that if you describe them actually word for word and, and motion for motion on radio, believe me, there would be a truck downstairs with the police department sign on it waiting for me when I come out of here and I would be busted. <laughs> Seriously. I, uh, television gets away with it, though. Have you have you noticed the one? Have you noticed how sex is beginning to creep into the commercials? Have you noticed the one where Barbie, uh, where Barbie, where Barbie, the girl who has been using the wrong shampoo, and her mother is sitting there. By the way, her mother, roughly in that commercial, looks like a grandmother. But Barbie and her mother are sitting in the living room, and Barbie is having trouble. She says, "I don't know whether Don, the boy with the brand new convertible, who is the top man in our senior class, will invite me to the dance tonight. Oh, mother, what will I do? My hair is all squabbly and rotten, and little grubbles are falling out of it." And mother says, "Well." That is a coincidence. I have just brought a bottle home from our friendly neighborhood druggist, that beautiful new grubble-free shampoo, soft whoopee shampoo, the soft ripple droplets of rain that will trickle down through your lovely golden tresses will make you desirable, Barbie. Oh, Ma, I think I will try it. And then she runs out, and you see that little thing flouncing up and down. You know, she's got the little skirt, and the little elite is going. And the next thing you know, there is old innocent Shep and 87 million other people looking at Barbie through a highly transparent shower curtain. Barbie is not even wearing a coat of shampoo. <laughs> And then Barbie suddenly looks out. Hey, Ma! Oh, boy! Does this stuff really work? And there's a little flick. We almost think we're going to hit the really pay dirt there. But no, by judicious clipping down there in the basement of BBD and all, oh, they've cut it out. Whoa! Almost! And then the next scene, Barbie is down in the living room. Ma! Ma! Boop, boop, boop! We hear a horn outside. Ma! It's that boy with that wonderful new convertible. Well, you tell that young man that if he's going to honk out there like that. But, Ma, he's waiting to take me to the dance. And white, whoopee, wonderful rain drip shampoo did it. And she flips that little thing and out she goes. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's getting there. It's getting there. Did you see that commercial? Listen, that's 50 times racier than the movies that, the, that it's put into, I'll tell you. And then there's the one, have you noticed the one where the, where the chick is, is obviously uh, making some kind of love to herself? It's, oh, that, that one, the one, you know, oh, boy, that's a, that's a wild one. I, oh, you know that one? Oh, you don't know this one? Oh. Well, I guess you, well, that's true. I think that's on the adults-only channel. They keep that one. No, actually, that's on the kids-only channel. That comes on during the cartoons and... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You know, speaking of the adults only, the kids only. Have you noticed that that in so many ways the the values are reversed? That almost all the adults who are roughly between the ages of uh, oh, I'd say thirty and forty five today are are going through a tremendous inversion of adulthood. That almost all of them are doing the things today frantically and maniacally that they would have liked to have done as kids or maybe did do as kids. I know a guy, I know a guy who is, who is well up there, who has an entire icebox full of Yoohoo. Uh, he lives totally on Yoohoo now, and uh, Yoohoo, and once in a while, an Eskimo pie when he's having formal dinners. 
Uh, oh yeah, and he wears stocking caps, that kind of thing, and high tops. And and he keeps going around trying to look for a place where he gets a knife with his shoes. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and have you noticed that the kids have done the opposite? The little squirts of twelve are living like their old man should have should be living. Oh yeah, they're they're reading the Wall Street Journal. I get more clippings from twelve year old kids from the Wall Street Journal. That's true. And and the forty eight year old guys send me clippings from Mad Magazine. That I mean, you know, you know which way it's going. And and everywhere you go, there are millions of of adult people are buying flexible flyers and are going out belly whopping. And I know one kid who gave his old man a BB gun for Christmas. And <laughs> Sure. And the old man gave him a martini shaker, by the way. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's literally true that, 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 that I suspect that the world is becoming so much for so many adult-type people that they want to run away into childhood. I'm looking for the day when, uh, when you are going to see over at the Adam Hat store, there's going to be a new adult hat fad, and it's going to be a leatherette helmet. And it's going to have, <laughs> yeah, a couple of those little plastic old goggles sticking up there on the top. And they'll be wearing them down the office. In fact, it, it, that, that there is a, new, a part of that, that going back into Kidsville, uh, which is really happening, that more and more adults are living on peanut butter and Mary Jane's. That's true. That's a big thing now. And the kids, of course, are eating oysters on the half shell and, and once in a while, a little champagne, and they, they, they dip into the smoked eel occasionally. And the kids are eating grown-up food, literally. And the adults are doing the stuff that they thought they should have done as kids. But, of course, they think they're imitating the kids of today. Whereas, as a matter of fact, I mean, you know, the kids of today are holed up somewhere with a, with a couple of joints. And, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a different scene. Now, I, all i got to say is it really is a different scene. And, and uh, of course... Uh, I think that this is only a natural consequence of the of the child worship that we have today. Uh, we worship children so much that we we tend to always emulate our gods. There's no question about it. That uh, that man has always, whatever god is up at the time, whatever one is occupying the top of the totem pole, that he tries to pattern his entire life after him. And m since since most families, even though they may maintain the outward uh, signs or, or maintain the outward, uh, I suppose you might say, rituals of other more formal religions. Their real religion is youth. Now, since it is youth, and a kid is already and automatically and is truly authentically youthful, then the kid becomes the, the kind of surrogate, in, in, a, in a way he becomes the object of religion, he becomes the icon, he becomes the go-between between the true, uh, the true worship, which is youth. Uh, and so since the kid is legitimately youthful, we worship him uh, as a kind of younger us. And so the, the child has become the god. Now, now of course, uh, there are sub-gods, and, and as in most uh, multiple god systems, there is a ranking of gods. That a girl god ranks higher than a male god in the new, uh, which would be natural in America, which has always had a matriarchal problem, but... But uh, now it's not really matriarchal. I don't know whether you can call a nine-year-old girl a matriarch. I, I'm not quite sure about that. But uh, 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 can, you, can you call her that? Can you call her that? Although I suppose philosophically you can. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a great uh, girl worship going on at this time, which, which then, since, since the girls, uh, this ad shows it right here, though, the goddesses, since we emulate our goddesses, that is one of the reasons why so many... Men are emulating women. It really, it is. It's it's one of the reasons why that that uh, that if, if you want to achieve the status. Now, what does a god have? You see, what are what are the things that a god has in in a society? For one thing, a god is beyond the laws. That's right. A god makes the laws, and more laws in this country are made by women than we'd ever care to admit. And if you've ever if you've ever even been near a divorce court, you'd know this. <laughs> I mean, you're seriously. Uh, uh, more laws are made by women, and of course, the interesting thing about them, not only are they, do they make the laws, but they are be above and beyond the laws they make, which is the, this is a true God status. So, you will find a movie star, a girl type, of course, writing in a, uh, a lady magazine about what true love is about, and how to remain faithful to your husband, and how to pick a true husband, and how to be a magnificent woman. Uh, what they don't mention is she's been married 37 times. 
uh, legally. Uh, the other times, well, <laughs> those were just, uh, you know how it is when you go out in the rain, you just try a few rounds and it doesn't work out. But uh, So it would never seem to be a dichotomy to the people who read this because she is beyond the laws which she lays down. Uh, a true God is. Uh, this is particularly true uh, if, if you are familiar with the, the Greek mythology. That, that the gods and goddesses, uh, they, they had a ball, you see, but everyone who was a, uh, a penitent or uh, who, who worshipped the shrine of any one of these guys, they expected his god or goddess to do that, you see, because after all, what fun is it being a god if you couldn't? <laughs> I mean, there's no point in being god if you don't have any kind of privileges. And so, so you will find that, that, uh, that, the, that uh, the, the worship of youth today has become probably the most the most important uh, single development of our time. It would never have occurred to a guy of, a, of 150 years ago to literally, uh, and I mean it, I actually mean it, I, I, know, I know many men who have devoted their entire lives to their children, literally. They have prostrated themselves for, before their children. And uh, a man could do no more for his God, literally. He had to do uh, that 150 years ago. Many a man would do this for the church. He would prostrate himself before the church, and half of his income or more would go into the church. And uh, he would devote all of his waking and working hours toward working. Toward, this is exactly what guys are doing now for their children. Now, of course, they'll say, they'll say to you, well, I want my kids to have everything that I didn't have, which... Uh, I wonder, you see, I, I wonder whether it's a selfish thing they're doing. I don't think they're worrying about the kid at all. I really don't. I, I think they're, they're, they're trying in some frantic way to get the kid to love them, which is a selfish thing, just like a guy 150 years ago was in a frantic way trying to get whatever God he worshipped to love him. He wanted this God to, <laughs> to take it easy on him when the time came. And, uh, and and many a parent, you see, is, is, is frantically trying to buy the love of that little god or goddess that is in the front bedroom, uh, who is now listening, by the way. <laughs> Hi, clown. How does it feel to be a god? <laughs> now, now uh, uh, the, the, the old man, of course, is, uh, of course, he's listening to this now and says, Oh, what are you, what's this nut talking about? For crying out loud, what a... Well, he knows very well. He can't get out of it. The old, uh, the, the, the old, the old flubber knows exactly what I'm talking about, and he knows, he knows that just like the uh, the the god of, of of yesteryear, that that when the when the guy was laying and paying obeisance to that god, when he was laying down the the uh, uh, putting down the tithes and he was throwing out the wreaths and everything else, he was hoping that when the day came. Now I capitalize that day, uh, when the day came. It would go easy on them. Well, now, what is the parent's the day? What is the day of the parent who is paying obeisance or obeisance, whichever you prefer, to the little god in the front bedroom? Well, that is the day when that kid all of a sudden looks up from his spaghetti <laughs> and says, says uh, uh, hey, and everyone looks up, look, I'm cutting out. Well, that is the day that every parent dreads. And, and they hope that when the kid finally cut out, cuts out and goes out on the lamb and leaves the cocoon, he will do so trailing love for them. That's exactly what they're hoping. Because the minute that the God leaves them, they are dead. Just, uh, this is one definition of death, you know, we can go and go into that. That's very philosophical, yeah, but it's very confusing there. But, but when, when the God, when your religion is dead to many people, you are dead, dead, dead. And so when the kid leaves the nest and goes down and makes the scene on Bleecker Street, and <laughs> then the family, because it has lost its God or goddess, is in, in uh, certain uh, religious philosophical concepts dead. And they want to be cast into heaven which is to say, get a phone call from the kid once a week to say, hey, Ma, yeah, yeah, it's okay, yeah, yeah, it's all, don't worry, Ma. What do you mean, Ma? I only got busted twice last year. What are you talking about? It didn't cost the old man more than 50 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, Ma, yeah, yeah. What chick? Oh, that chick, for crying out loud, she's been out of here for a month. There's a new one, Barbie, yeah. Yeah, I'll bring her over sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Ma. Yeah, I'll be careful. What, Ma? She knows all about it. This chick knows. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ma. Yeah. 
Hey, look, will you get off my back? Yeah, yeah, I'll call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look. Look, Ma, will you... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Ma, yeah, yeah. Hey, Barbie! She wants to say hello. Look, she can't come to the phone now, Ma. Yeah. All right, Ma, I'll call next week. Yeah, say good... Yeah, yeah, say hello to Pa, yeah. Bye! Oh, boy, what a... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that that is one definition of heaven. Getting a call from the kid. Uh, it's a it's a great it's a great thing. Now now even better than that is once every six months getting a letter. Now now uh, it's it's really it's like having a visitation in the old days of uh, of uh, religion when there was a different kind of religion, a visitation or a vision or some kind of a sign. That's in capital letters, a sign. And so the sign is to get that phone call when it isn't on a holiday. You see. <laughs> if it is on a holiday, it doesn't count. Not really. It's only a half a pointer. If it's on Thanksgiving, it's a quarter pointer if it's on Christmas. And if it's on the kid's birthday, nothing. Kid's looking for a handout. So, oh yeah, oh, as a matter of fact, one of the most interesting aspects, of course, of this new uh, worship of youth and the God and goddess is that many families attempt to, to forestall that day, and I'm in caps, that day, by when the day arrives and the, the, the chick or the guy decides they're going, to cut, they're going to cut out, they're going to get married or something, that the parents are, are offended if they are not allowed to completely finance the marriage. In other words, uh, the, the, the kid and the, the, his wife are, are totally paid for by the mother and by the father so they can continue to pay, you see, because most people do not believe in a religion that does not exact a toll. And, oh yes, and as long as a toll is being exacted, that means somehow you've got a direct connection with God. Uh, in fact, this is one of the reasons why many of the very poverty-stricken nations are tremendously uh, religious, because they feel that they are constantly, uh, there is a toll being exacted of them. And so they have a very, they have a very close relationship with, with their God, whatever God it might be. But as a nation grows more and more affluent and the tolls get harder and harder to spot, hence the, uh, there is a sense of growing further and further and further away from whatever God might be worshipped at the time. And so in the family, since the God is right there in the hall bedroom and yelling every 20 minutes for more dough and saying, look, uh, you see, one of the hardest things about gods is to get them to love you. Uh, this is a problem that, that the religious uh, has been part of the religious uh, thing uh, for ever, forever. The, if, if you could get the goddess of fire or the god of the, the forest to get off your back uh, 30 million years ago, you've made it. If you could get the god of the storm to quit hitting you with lightning, uh, somehow yeah, you'd made it. And, and the most general way to do this was through the human sacrifice. Now, we do that today, of course. Usually the human sacrifice is the old man in the family. And, and uh, the mother is more or less the priestess. And so uh, she, she is the go-between between between the human sacrifice. The priestess sacrifices the old man before the god of this little squirt uh, who's in the hall bedroom. And she does it in many ways. Like, now look, are you going to give him trouble? Now, uh, now, uh, now look, Charles, things are different than when you and I were kids. Fork it over. And by the way, uh, about the car tonight, Charles, you're just going to have to take a cab. Because little Carl, yes, I'm sorry, he's... <laughs> and so there is the human sacrifice stretched out there on the stone altar at Stonehenge with the spear sticking out of his heart and his ears cut off and the blood draining down into the sacrificial trough, with the kid, which the kid is about to drink, you see, making the sign and then putting the wreath on his head and going out and getting into the Pontiac Tempest, well named. <laughs> and... Uh... And, 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 and he goes bombshelling off down, down U.S. 4, as, as all true gods and goddesses do, riding a thunderbolt. Or is it a thunderbird? But nevertheless, uh, this, this uh, god analogy can be carried all the way. Not, now, now, of course, these are very fickle gods. Gods have always been. And the, the more fickle a god, the more you attempt to assuage his anger, the more you, you stick with him. So if you have a calm, benign God, nobody wants a calm, benign God because, you know, you can get along with them too easy. You want a God that once in a while belts you with a lightning bolt. 
And so every third or fourth week when the kid is brought home by three cops, screaming and yelling and kicking with the smell of marijuana around him, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and trailing the odor of the pool room behind him, that is a lightning bolt. So once again, we must assuage the God. And you will find that in many homes, the wilder and the stinkier the kid is, the greater comes the gifts, and the greater will come the love offerings. And so it is always with God's. The more lightning that strikes the primitive man, the more guys he sacrifices, invariably. The more thunderous forest fires that roar throughout his homeland and destroy continents, the more, the more sheaves of grain he will lay out. The more rabbits he will kill. The more dromedaries he will skin, all to assuage the fantastic wrath of this thunderous god. Well, uh, so we have it, you know. And, and, and uh, I, I, wonder, I wonder how many gods and goddesses are listening tonight who have just tuned over to WABC and the Swing and Whoopies. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you this. Now, now, like all true religions, I'm sure that there are many parents, penitents, excuse me, who are listening tonight, who feel that I am now being sacrilegious. Oh, yes, I'll get, I'll get angry letters about this. I'm being very sacrilegious about this whole scene. And yet, yet all the while, that little enigmatic Buddha sitting in the front hall room there is chuckling away, laughing. Ha, <laughs> ha, chuckle, chuckle, wow, wow. Well, that's all right, kid. You play it for all it's worth because, you know, it isn't, any, it isn't every generation, believe me, that is truly descended from Valhalla. It is not every generation that not only has, well, actually not descended from Valhalla, I should say resides in Valhalla. They have not descended from Valhalla. And so, as, as, as they look down, I'm curious, though, uh, how they look down upon all the people on the plain, which, of course, is what we've always thought about God. Uh, how, many, how many articles have you seen within the, within the past six months called... Uh, uh, how to understand the teenager. Do you understand that lout that keeps throwing stuff through your window? And of course, have you noticed that the guilt always comes back to the penitent, which is always the case with true religions. It's, uh, always, that any time the, the thunderbolts come down and destroy everybody, it's because the people were rotten. <laughs> it is just because the people were somehow rotten, and, and, and you'll notice that almost every sociological tract that is written on children of today always says it's the parents' fault when the kid burns the garage down, invariably. Well, it's always been this way with religion. The priests have always said to you, whenever 17 guys got hit by the tidal wave, it is because we have sinned. It is because we have been rotten in our souls. We have not had enough faith. And so you'll find the sociological worker, the plotter in the wheat fields, the man out there flaying away in the vineyards of the new religion, when he appears on Barry Farber's show, will say, well, we must realize that all the parents are at fault. You can't say anything about the kids. It's not the kids. It's the old man. It's the parents. Yes, look into your souls. Where have you sinned? Where have you sinned? Why did he burn down the garage? You have sinned.